divide these complicated looking areas into uh, somewhat smaller shapes. So let me start the recording. And there aren't going to be many example problems, mainly because we're going to be working through a lot of the basic stuff, except maybe focusing more on proving it. So yeah, let me get a whiteboard up. Let me start recording. Oh, it's still recording. Great. And yeah, we can get started. All right, so now here's a question to all of you that you can direct to me. Any other questions that I don't explicitly go over, please direct to the esteemed Andrew Kai. So what are some like shapes that come up? Like shapes that you think that we need to know? All right, I'm seeing a lot of great answers. Thank you, everybody who sent me stuff. But the first one I saw was the square. The next one I saw is the triangle, and then the circle. I also saw some like hexagons in there. I see one pentagon, maybe maybe more, and I just missed it. One more pentagon. Uh, cube, that's a great one. Unfortunately, we're not going to be going into 3D geometry today. That's for another day. Uh, trapezoid, thank you. Are there any other like major ones that I'm missing? Uh, rhombus and, oh yes, rectangle, the generalized circle. I'm seeing a lot of quadrilaterals here. We'll have to go over each of them. All right, we have the rhombus and it's causing the kite. Uh, rectangle I have right here, uh, dodecagon, ellipse. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of these, but these are starting to get into obscurity, really. Uh, you all forgot the parallelogram. How could we? The right triangle, we'll get into that later. Yes, ellipses actually do not come up too much in competition math, so we actually don't really need to go over them. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of triangles come up. But yeah, all of these are shapes that you might encounter in a math competition. But the interesting ones are gonna be those that combine them. Things like, for example, what would you call this? the shape that I'm filling in right here. Concave, I like that. All right. It doesn't have a name. It's not an integral. The way that I constructed this is I took these two sides to have equal length and this is a circular arc. I see square minus semicircle. It's more accurately a square minus a quarter circle, but yeah, that's the idea. All right, and the point is, this doesn't have like a nice compact name, like all of these do. Like we have square, rhombus, pentagon, this, square, except you carve out a small chunk of a circle. And yet we still might be at, we still might be like asked to find the area or something like this. So the main part, the main idea for this is we're going to try and figure out how to develop tools that will let's, let us find the area of all sorts of things. And to do that, we're going to need to start at the fundamentals. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on here. Because you'll find that like, although the fundamentals may be easy, you might have them memorized. Knowing why they're true is maybe a bit more complicated. So now let me ask you all this question. Out of all of these shapes, which one is the most fundamental? I have not received the answer that I think most people would say. There we go. Yeah, most people said about by far and far the circle. That's great because the circle is like, 
I think I, I feel confident in saying 100% of what all curve lines in basic competition math are. But a lot of people say square. I personally am partial to the triangle. And the triangle, because you can make, aside from the circle, circle's a special kid, child. You can make every one of these shapes out of just a bunch of triangles. So if we have control over the triangle, you could argue that we have control over each of these shapes. And that is true to a certain extent. There may be more specialized formulas for each of these quadrilaterals right here. The triangle is the most important by far. And that's what we're going to be wanting to focus on. Focus on. So let's start, let's start there. We'll take a look at circle stuff later because that's actually a mild bit easier. So let's look at a triangle, all right? And what is a triangle? A triangle looks like this, yay. It could also look like this. What would we, would we give this triangle a special type of name? Right triangle, excellent. Yeah, okay, how about this triangle? My drawing is obviously not the scale, but Oops. I see acute. Yes, that is correct, because each of these angles is less than this right angle right here. And I also see equilateral. And that's what I intended it to look. That's when all these sides are the same. This comes up a lot. I also see equiangular. I really like that. All these angles happen to be equal. OK, what might be the defining characteristic of this triangle? See, obtuse, yeah, everybody, I instantly gravitated towards this angle. But if you squint at it from a certain point of view, you might also be able to argue that this is isosceles. Like this. Somebody said scaling, and yeah, that definitely could be the case from the diagram, but I'd like to use this as a better example. So, yeah, there are lots of different triangles, but what we care about right now is finding the area. So let's go find the area. Yes, it is obtuse. So if I asked you to name an area formula, how many do you think you could name? I'm not asking for any specific ones right now. That will come later. How many do you think you could think of off the top of your head? I see, I'm seeing answers that range from two to five to eight, actually. Wow. It's, area formulas. I do not think we have time to go through all of those. But to the people who said two, just somebody who said two, tell me which two they are, and then I can start with those. Ah, yes, the uh, buzz, the buzzwords. Yes, I will start with those. So the first one is the one that everybody knows because everybody has been to school. I hope. That is exemplified by the following picture. This is the height, this is the base. Area is base times height over two. Yeah, none of us go to school now, I believe. So now let's take a look at how to prove this. And this is actually a bit more annoying than you might expect because it's hard to determine what you can assume. Like why, because area is like a finicky concept and it has like a weird, it has weird definitions, but the most fundamental way of figuring out area is to make a rectangle like this. And if this is the base and this is the height, then the area of this is base times height. So let's first prove this for right triangles. And this is going to be really basic form of proof, but I think it's a great example of the type of rigor that might be needed on such a problem. It's better, always better to go overkill than underkill. So let's do it for right triangles first, because right triangles are nice. 
because as one of you has been insisting on, we can describe things in terms of right triangles. So of course we can rotate this around the center. Let's call this base, let's call this height. And we see that these two things are exactly the same. So since the area of the entire rectangle is base times height, we get in this case base times height over two as desired. So now we have this. Let's figure out this case. All right, and this is the case where the top angle is sort of like within the boundaries. So in this case, what we want to do is draw another rectangle. And to do this, you're going to go like that. Um, that. This is a bit messy, but whatever. And now we have two right triangles. Yeah, right here and right there. And we can just apply these to each of these. So let's call this x, let's call this y. So then we know that this is xh over 2, and this is yh over 2. So when we add these together, we get x plus y times h over 2, or once again, exactly what we want. All right, great. So are we done? I see a no in the chat. Oh, we need to take care of obtuse triangles? Is that what you all are saying? Yeah, let's take care of obtuse triangles. All right, so we're going to go like this. All right, and I'm making sure that this angle is obtuse. All right, and then we can just do this. All right, call this xy, xy over 2 or xh over 2, yh over 2. And then when we add these together, we get bh over 2. All right, so are we done now? Uh, sorry, I'm not in the capacity to answer raised hands easily right now. I see, I see a couple of yeses, and actually, we're not done, because what you said about an obtuse angle being correct, being needed, was correct, but I intentionally misinterpreted it. Because what we need to do is, what you actually were getting at is, we need to take a look at this. All right, where this is the base and this is the height. So we see this case, like the, uh, this top, vertex lies directly above one of these two base vertices. In this case, they lie between. But what if it lies outside? Like this. Do you see that this is like this is like something that we have actually not covered because we're going to have to do a different calculation in order to get this. Unfortunately, as is before, it's not that bad. Let's call this entire thing x and this little thing y. Yep, we still make a rectangle. So then, how are we going to figure out the area of this triangle using what we already know? Well, we can just do the same thing, yeah, with the right triangles. So this big right triangle is xh over 2. But now instead of adding, we have to subtract y over three, yh over two. And look, what is the base? Just x minus y. All right, yeah, so yeah, this was a simple one. But it's still necessary to just go over. So now we're going to look at Heron's formula. Heron's formula. 
That was the other one that everybody knows. So can anybody give me the statements? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, a formula for I'm seeing a lot of a is equal to the square root of s times s minus a times s minus b. What is this s? S is semi-perimeter. OK. So what people are saying is, first, we had to define this like weird semi-perimeter thing. And what is? So you're saying the area is going to be the square root of s times s minus a times s minus b times s minus c. All right, great. So I think a lot of people have seen this before. Has anybody ever proved this? I have, think I've gotten one yes and a bunch of no's. All right, so this was something that none of you have ever done before. So that means I can actually do something. All right, and this proof is going to use all the base, all the area formulas we have used before. And let me ask you, how many area formulas have we covered before this one? We have only covered one. So that should already give you a big hint as to what I'm going to do. So A, B, and C. Let's say this is, the th this is what we have here. All right, and I think there might be a more intuitive version, but this one's simple. So you're going to be surprised. It's not that bad. So I said based on height. So let's just like draw a height. Let's call it H. And the first instinct might be, we, we should solve for h. So we can call this x and y, where x plus y is equal to a. All right, note that I did not substitute this for a minus x. The reason that I did not do it is because this keeps the symmetry that's inherent in the problem. And I want as much symmetry as possible. So can, is there an obvious relation that we can see from these from these variables. Ah, nobody is coming up and saying it, but I will say that we have right triangles. And what do we do with right triangles? Yes, Pythagorean theorem. Great. So we could, we should do that here. So we have c squared is equal to h squared plus x squared. All right. And also, we should do it on the other side, too. So what's something we could do? We could substitute. We could substitute for this common variable h right here. So what happens when we do that? We can subtract these two equations. c squared minus b squared is x squared minus y squared. We have x squared minus y squared, and we have x plus y. Does that mean, is there anything else that we have as a result of these two? It turns out there is, and uh, yeah, it's x minus y. And this is because this is a difference of squares. So we can, there's a factor in here. So what we see is that x minus y 
is equal to c squared minus b squared. All right, did everybody see what I did there or does anybody want me to explain further? All right, I'm gonna keep pressing forward then. All right, so now what we can do is we can solve for x, plug it into here to solve for h, and then we can just figure out the area from that. So let's get rid of the stuff at the top. We're gonna rederive it anyway. So what, we, what do we do? When we solve for x is equal to, and when we put this over a common denominator, a squared plus c squared minus b squared over 2a. So let's put that into here. What, what do we get? So h squared is going to be equal to c squared minus this squared. Oh, we can use a difference of squares. All right, this is, this is really cool stuff that we're doing right here. So h squared is gonna be equal to c plus a squared plus c squared minus b squared over 2a times c minus a squared plus c squared minus b squared over 2a. And if you think this is complicated, sure it is, but these are actually expressions that are relatively tame in the long run, especially when you get to complex numbers. All right, I erased the diagram, but all we need to know is that the base is A. So let's, let, let's combine these factors, all right? And you see the, like, how I'm like, trying to factor like, aggressively at every opportunity so that I keep the expression manageable. Having expand this, expanding this out would just be no good. So, so what do we get? a squared plus two, okay, when I multiply here, two ac plus c squared. Oh, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. So then a negative a squared plus two ac minus c squared plus b squared. So this is equal to h squared. And now I'm going to multiply by a squared over four. Now, why am I doing that? Because when I take the square root of this, we get a times height over two, which is the area. So this is gonna be, uh, okay, I'll just note it here, times a squared over four. So now we get, on the top we can factor, like this and like this. All this is over 16 now, since we multiplied by a squared over four. So now all we have to do, okay, let's simplify this a bit more. All right, we apply difference of squares. And let me clean up the right side, the left side. Huh. So here. And I think hopefully you're starting to see the formula take shape. Uh, this is gonna be, we can, B plus A minus C times B minus A plus C. That's expanding this factor. Difference of squares over two times two times two times two. And then we're gonna take the square root of that and get the area. And if you substitute for the semi-perimeter, what you get is 
S times S minus V times S minus C. Exactly what we wanted. So as a result of all that work, we're done. So I'm assuming that you haven't really gone through this every time you use Heron's formula. And just, I, I just want you to realize that there's this, all this working in the background every time you use it. It's not exactly a trivial result. So you're wielding a lot of power when you use it. And it's, it's great that it's a theorem and that it's able to be easily memorizable. But there are more triangle area formulas. Can anybody name another simple one that we haven't covered yet? Law of cosines is a great relation, but it doesn't help us with the area of a triangle. All right, uh, I will volunteer one then since everybody's so equal. Pythagorean theorem is also not in area formula. All right, new ones. All right, let's call this A, let's call this B, let's call this angle C. So the area of this is actually equal to AB times the sine of C all over two. And hopefully, does anybody not recognize the sine function from trigonometry? All right, and the way that you prove this is you drop this altitude and you know that like this is B sine C by definition. Opposites over hypotenuse. So then you multiply these two and you divide by two. So it's actually just base times height over two in disguise. And I think that's kind of cool. So but that's another one that's worth knowing. When we know to use this is when we have these two sides and this included angle. And it really helps if this included angle is like 15, 30, 45, 60, any of those nice ones that we know the sine and cosine of. So another one. Uh, I see another one. Now we're, now we're getting into circles. All right, why am I drawing an in circle? Because it turns out there's actually a way to Write the area of this triangle purely in terms of the radius and the semi-perimeter. So the way, the proof of this is kind of nice. We'll leave it as an exercise, but it's worth covering. All right, and the way that you prove this is you draw these lines to the tangency points. And now you have three base times height situations. Let me make them extra, extra clear. There's one, there's a second, there's a, th there's a third. So what are we gonna do? All right, this is R, R, R. We have AR over two plus BR over two plus CR over two is equal to the area, but hey, this is like R times A plus B plus C over two, which is just the semi-perimeter. So that's how we get this. I'm hoping that some of you haven't seen this before because this is a really nice argument. And we actually use this, this, be this exact same thing to find the area in terms of an X circle. Now, what is an X circle, you might ask? It's this thing. Let's hope I can draw it so that you all won't laugh at me. the scuffed circle, but oh well. So we might call this the AX circle because it's opposite side A. And it turns out this is actually a great exercise. Let's call this RA. You can prove that the area is equal to R A times B plus C minus A over two, I think. Is this right, Andrew? All 
Oh, I hope it is. Okay, thanks. So just think about it for a second while that's true, and then we'll move on. So, okay, so there's one final one that I'd like to go over. All right, and this is the circumradius formula. So I'm going to set this up and I want you all to tell me if there's any area formulas that I'm missing. So now we have, we had in circles, we have X circles, and now finally we have circumcircles. And yeah, so how are we gonna find an area formula like this Pythagorean theorem? I'm not sure that's gonna help here. Well, maybe we could try something like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that actually will work nicely. So we can call this angle B. So then this angle is 2B, this is R. So this angle, uh, If anybody is lost, like please like tell me now because like otherwise there's like really no point in this. This is gonna be R sine B, R cosine B. No, 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 that, that, that's sine. So 2r sine b is actually going to be equal to the length b. So this is how we actually derive the extended law of sines done accidentally. And the reason that we can do that is because we can plug this into a c sine b over 2. All right, everybody remember this formula, except I've moved it around a bit of the variables. The neat thing is like we can solve for sine the b like this. So we plug it in, we get a, b, c all over four r. And this is another area formula. Okay, anybody have any other formulas they'd like me to go over? Uh, Pythagorean theorem is not an area formula, so. Uh, and I also already went over the A plus B minus C formula, so. Oh. You can just view the recording once we upload that. Oh, yeah, that, that, is, that is an excellent point. Uh, thank you, Rashab. Equilateral triangle, like this. And now we get to use the Pythagorean theorem. So what we do is we're going to, this is going to be a great application at base times height. So if this is S, this is an equilateral triangle, so it cuts it in two. So we can use Pythagorean theorem on this triangle right here, and we get that it's S root three over two right here. So the base is, of course, s. So this is 1 half the base. So we just multiply these two, and we get s squared root 3 over 4. Thank you for reminding me about this. This will be important when we go and discuss apothems later.
So yeah, now we need to get into general general formulas. So I'm just going to write down a list of famous quadrilaterals and like how you can find the areas. I do not, I will not go over Shirley's formula today. Shirley's formula does not need to be really need to be learned. Uh, yeah. S squared, or you can also do it by taking the diagonal squared and dividing it by two. It's a nice simplification that I've used my fair share of times. All right, this is BH, of course. This is average of bases times the height. All right, this is also BH. It's just parallelogram. Kite. Uh, kites are best found in terms of the products of the diagonals. And you can prove all these just using what we know about triangles. And that's another thing that I want to emphasize. Uh, chevrons are just two triangles. I don't know if there's a standard way to characterize them. And now we have this rhombus. Rhombus is interesting because it's both a kite and a parallelogram. So we could use either of these formulas. And sometimes one works better than the other. Are there any of these shapes that I've just named that you're confused about the definitions for? Uh, okay, hopefully not. All right, so to finish, Yeah, for the area, the rhombus, we could just do D1, D2, D2 over 2, or base times height. Whatever works. All right, so I'm going to close with two more formulas. One is the area of the equilateral or the regular hexagon. And the way that you do that, you're saying how to do it right now. Break it up into six equilateral triangles. This is S. We just saw that the area of the equilateral triangles, S root three over four, so we multiply by six. And that's it. The point of these formulas is that I want to show a way that like you could get to them at some point. And if you know the way to get to them, because those are oftentimes like a lot easier to memorize, then it's not, then actually like memorizing them is not necessary. All right, the final one is a general way of finding the method for any polygon, like say a regular, regular seven gun. This method is kind of silly, but it is worth mentioning. Uh, somebody asked how to derive the area formula of a pentagon. This is a general method, so it will actually work. So what I'm drawing are known as apothems, basically lines from the center to the perpendicular. And what we can do is we can divide these into smaller triangles. I probably should have reversed the... Uh, thicknesses of the lines, but hopefully this comes out okay. So let's say we knew the length of this apothem. Let's call it A. And let's say we knew the side length is S. So then the area of this triangle is AS over two, base times height. So now we're gonna multiply that by seven in this case, because there are seven of these triangles and they're all congruent, of course. But you can multiply it by anything. So you could say NAS over two. Nobody memorizes this. They just memorize the fact that, oh, look, you can break it up into triangles like that. All right, so in the case of the area of a pentagon, you could just say it's like 5AS over 2. But how do we find A? You have to base it reduces to knowing the trigs, trig, trig identities, or this the trig formulas for. Like, I think it's equivalent to sine of 18 or cosine of 18. 
and that's another can of worms that if I start talking about now, I might not finish until class is over. So we'll just solve that right now. It's a great thing to look into. All right. So any more questions about uh, figures that are made entirely of straight lines? Going in five, four, three, two, one. If there are no more questions, then let's go to things with curved lines, circles. What is the area of this? Yay, we're done. But not really, because there are a couple of common things that are done with circles that deserve some mentioning. All right, so first off, uh, you can uh, cut circles into sectors. So let's say I have this, I'm going, to get, I'm going to be extra mean. All right, let's say the circle has radius 9, and this is an 80-degree sector. What is the area of this right here? How are we going to calculate that? Oh, this is 80 degrees, not radians. So how are we going to calculate that? Don't, don't just give me the answer. Ah, so people are telling me, start with the pi r squared formula. So that's the area of the entire circle, 81 pi. And now what you're saying is, I take this 80 and I divide by 360. And I see why that's true, because it's like the proportion of the whole, because everything's symmetric. So we are left with 18 pi. OK, so let's say same problem, but a bit of a twist. Uh, let's now find the area of this. How are we going to do that? A uh, sector triangle? Sector minus triangle, yeah. So we're going to need that 18 pi from earlier. Oops. Going to need that 18 pi from earlier, and we're going to need to subtract out something. We're going to need to take, like, basically take this entire sector, except subtract out this triangle. Oh, and uh, look, we have we have a nine and a nine. So, what is a really nice way that we can express the area of this triangle? Yep, people are giving me the uh, A, B, sine, C formula. You recognize that because we have this picture, two sides and an included angle. So 81 sine of 80 degrees over 2. Can't, and also, you cannot forget the over 2. This is the best we can do with this problem because sine of 80 does not have a good expression like at all. Fortunately, you will never encounter a situation where you have to evaluate the sine of 80. So if instead this was like sine of 60, I hope you know to write this right triangle, 1, 1 half, 3 over 2, and then substitute that in there instead. So I think that's everything for circles. Uh, let's get into a few practice problems. So this is going to be more like the way that I usually go over things. Oh no, where is the, uh, 
uh, it appears I am unable to move this up. All right, so are you able, is everybody able to just see the presentation? All right, excellent. So there is a problem for you to just think about. This one's really basic application. All right, so let's let's do this. Uh, you share. All right, so let me just recreate the diagram really quickly. This is the diameter. Oh, we have a lot of diameters in this problem, and that's really nice. All right, and basically, let's just think about the best way to express each of these triangles. All right, so I'm not interested in a particularly nice solution here. I'm interested in one that works. So it should be D, this is C and that's an E, and this is a right angle. And this is like X and this is two X. So we want, all right, and in case you haven't seen this before, these brackets are just uh, a way of designating area. And I shouldn't even have these triangle symbols in here, but whatever. So we want to figure out the area of DCE and we want to figure out the area of ABD. So let's, let's start with the bottom, the ABD. How can we figure out the area of ABD? Uh, nobody. All right. So what formula could, which one of the formulas could we use? Let's start with that. Half base times height, nice. And I see a really obvious space right in front of me. I see AB, which we already know the length of, and DC. So we want one half times AB times DC. So is there, does anybody know a way that we could find the length of DC? Uh, I see three X. That's the length of AB for sure, but it's not DC. Uh, nobody has the way that I think works the cleanest in this case because everything else seems to like need to like figure out all these all these side lengths, and that's not necessary here. What we can do is we can do similar triangles. So this is the pair of similar triangles right here: ACD and DCB. So we get that h, x over h is equal to h over 2x. All right, and this is, this is like a bit pushing, like the whole like area thing, but whatever, it's a good thing to know in any case. 
All right. So we have these length ratios and we get that H is going to be X root two. So now we have, this is one half times three X times X root two equals X squared times three root two over two. That's the area of this right here. So we're halfway done. But now we need to think, uh, we're gonna figure out D. And this is the million dollar question right here. So does anybody have any ideas for this? What area formula could we use for DCE? A, B sine C is an interesting option, but we unfortunately don't really know the sign of this angle. Or unless you could like tell me a way to figure it out, but. A, D times D, B, that's the uh, area of A, D, B. I'm looking at D, C, E right now, the top of this denominator. I think that we can actually get away with using base height over base times height over two. So now we need to figure out how in the blazes we are going to do that. Well, let's start by figuring out. Let me call this O. Can any of you give me an expression for CO? The length of CO. All right, yeah, it is one half X. And the reason is like a detail that you might have overlooked in the original problem or you just maybe didn't see. DE is also a diameter, which means that this is the center of the circle, which means that it splits this segment in two, which means that this is 0.5 X. So if this is 0.5 X. And let's see what I wanna do here. Oh no, what have I done? Uh, oh, sorry, I, it appears I have, there we go. This is 0.5 X and this is X root two right here. Then I think that we could figure out the heights of this triangle with the base DE. Now, can anybody tell me what the length of DE is equal to? All right, the length of DE is equal to 3x simply because this is the diameter and we already established the diameter was 3x. So one half times DE times, let's call this like H1. So if we find H1, we're golden. And one way we can do that is we can look at DCO. We know that this is 3x over 2. DO is 3x over 2. So we have this triangle right here. 3x over 2, 3 halves x, 1 half x, and x root 2. And we want to find this height because that's the height of the triangle that we want. So what we could do is we could use the base height, height over two formula twice and find the area of DCO instead. So how can we do that? Here we have one fourth X squared root two. And here we have three fourths XH. All right, I just applied the area formula in two different ways. So we get that H is actually equal to root, oops. H is actually equal to root two over three.
So we plug that in here. And these should all be H1s, by the way. Sorry for not clarifying, but hopefully you all understood. 1 half times 3x times x root 2 over 3. So this is equal to x root 2 over 2. Yes. And yeah, this does, this is correct. So when we put all this together, when we divide this, it's an x squared, well, and we divide by this, we're gonna answer one thirds. Are there any questions? No questions. Wow. Uh, all right, so I am close to being out of time, so I might like do this next one really quickly and, or leave it as an exercise to you all. But I want to touch on the points that there are two main methods of finding the areas of non-standard shapes. So we're going to just skip to this last question right here. And just take a look at it. And while you're looking at it, let me talk about these two methods. All right, so I think of these methods as additive and subtractive. And they work in a couple of different ways. All right, so the additive method is where you start with like, you start like completely inside the shape and you figure it out directly, maybe going piece by piece. And the subtractive method is where you have this external structure, like a rectangle or maybe a hexagon, hint, hint, and you chop away pieces of that. It finds everything. So it turns out that Problem is not that clear. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I had a blurry capture of it. So yeah, in this, in this case, I think it's actually going to be necessary to use sort of, sort of both. Or there is a solution with both. So I'm going to just go ahead and demonstrate that. Uh, what do I need to do? Share. Let's go to the whiteboard for, for one. Hmm, people are able to see chat. That, that is unusual. Hmm, well, no time to worry about that now because I want to take care of this. So let me just, I'm just going to outline these two approaches. And okay, so we have one, 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 and we have R, R, and R right here. And we have this equilateral triangle in the middle whose area is 70%. Of the entire hexagon. So we are going to need to find the area of the entire hexagon. So how can we find the area of the entire hexagon? This is the million dollar question at the moment. Uh, I see a law of cosines. I do not see how that helps me because it says that's only a way to relate lengths, not areas. Equilateral triangles, congruent triangles. Oh, congruent triangles. That's an interesting statement. So I know these are all 120s. So I have this angle side or side angle side congruence right here. So 
side angle side, side angle side, side angle side. So I can find the areas of all three of these. And that's pretty easy because we know the formula for, to use for this. That's one half, one half AB sine C. So now I'm gonna draw my, this triangle because I, I, I don't have the sine of 120 memorized. All of you math counts kids probably have that up on me. So we get that it's R root three over four. And we multiply by three because there are three of these, nice. So we just found the area of each of these. But in order to find the area of the entire hexagon, we're gonna need this equilateral triangle and we need that anyway. So one way to find this side length is to use the law of cosines, but I prefer a slightly different argument. There is a spider on my desk. I hope it does not bother me. So we can do this without the law of cosines by drawing, looking at it like this and draw, dropping an altitude. And let's just say that this is one and this is R. So this is one half and this is root three over two. So then we can take R plus one half squared, then add three fourths for this squared, take the square root of that. That actually equals R squared plus R plus one. So that's how we get this. You see, this was just a basic application of the Pythagorean theorem, except we had to draw a bit of extra stuff. And of course, we have to note the 30, 60, 90 right triangle right here. All right, cool. So now we can take this, r squared plus r plus 1 times root 3 over 4. So if we add these together, we get 3r root 3 over 4. And on the top, of course, we just get r squared. And then you can set, this is like the, uh, this is that 70%. So you can set this equal to 7 tenths and you can solve for r if you want. I'm going to go ahead and not do that because that just wastes time. It doesn't really, that's not really areas, but it's possible. It's just quadratics. This is actually the tame one. But I want to uh, also show you a different approach. All right, this was a great example of the additive approach where you take these like four different pieces and you add them together to get the entire area of the hexagon. However, there is actually a different way. And this way is a bit, bit more clever. So I'm gonna redraw this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to extend We have one R, R, one, one. So you see that this is like the same hex gun as the original problem, but I've attached these equilateral triangles to the core, to like the edges. So because they're equilateral triangles, we get all of these. So now the trick here is that we're gonna find the area of the hex gun by finding the area of the big triangle first, then subtracting off each of these. This is the subtractive method, starting from a bigger shape that encloses it, then cutting off the pieces that we don't want. I think this is how sculpting works too, where you start with like this giant block of stone and you just chisel away bits, exactly what we're doing here. So let's find the area of the big equilateral triangle. So that's just one plus two R is the side length squared for three over four, like that. So then we have to subtract away three times these. R squared, root three over four. Is anybody confused as to where I'm getting these formulas from? They're just the area formulas for the equilateral triangle. And when I do that, I get R squared plus four R plus one root three over four. 
And that's what we would have gotten. That's what we would have gotten if we went ahead and evaluated this the first way. So you see that they are two different methods. They give the same answer and they both have their merits. So it's always good to keep both of these in mind. Think, should I add pieces together or should I subtract pieces and take them apart? And both of these methods will be helpful when solving more or less any shape or area problem. Just have to think about it in the right way. All right, that is all I have for you today. We'll try and get up this and like a lot of other handouts soon. But in the meantime, if you have any other questions, please feel free to message me on Discord and I'll try and respond as quickly as I can. No promises, but I should be able to get you something. So if there are no last questions, if there are last questions, you should be sending them to me now.